Greetings, welcome to Electronics 2. This is lecture number 21 and I am Bezar Rosavi. Today we will uh, build upon what we have learned in terms of the parasitic capacitances of bipolar and MOSFETs and try to analyze uh, quantitatively uh, some of the basic circuits that we have seen in the past and try to derive their frequency response, uh, transfer function, and try to understand what limits the high frequency performance of these circuits. All right, uh, just a quick review of what we saw last time. Uh, we identified the capacitances of bipolar and MOS transistors. We saw that a bipolar transistor comes with three capacitances, uh, C pi, C mu, and the collector substrate capacitance, CCS. And the MOSFET comes with four capacitances. We see we have CGS, CGD, and then two caps from the drain and the source to AC ground, CDB and CSB. Okay, so any circuit that we see uh, consisting of these transistors, we have to include these capacitances before we proceed to the high frequency analysis. All right, we also observed that uh, when, after we drop in these capacitors, sometimes they can be merged so that the circuit can be simplified. Uh, so if you consider, for example, a cascode structure, we see that M1 has a capacitance from its drain to ground, CDB1, from here, right? And then uh, M2 has a capacitance between the gate and the source, CGS2. And it just happens that uh, this terminal is AC grounded because it's a constant voltage, and this terminal is ground, and they share the same terminal, so these two caps become one cap because they are exactly in parallel. So we just replace them by one capacitor equal to CDB1 plus CGS2. All right, we also saw that uh, some capacitors in the circuit experience similar effect, some don't. And again, before we jump into equations, it's good to see which ones do that. So here, for example, we see that M1, which receives the input here, has a capacitance between its gate and drain, CGD1, and that capacitance does experience Miller effect because there's some signal here and there's some signal here, right? But for example, these two do not because they go from the signal path to ground, they don't go from one point in the signal path to another point in the signal path. Okay, so today uh, we will uh, introduce a general procedure for computing the frequency response of circuits and then try to apply that to uh, uh, the common emitter common source stage, the first amplifier stage that we studied in Electronics 1. Okay, so let's start with a general procedure. for uh, frequency response computation. This is really a summary of what we have seen so far. There's nothing new. So in the first step, we uh, draw the circuit, obviously, right? So draw the circuit. In the next step, we include all of the capacitances that we can identify. So draw all of the device capacitances, just the way we did last time. Okay, uh, next, the third step, <coughs> We try to see if any capacitances can be merged or removed. We saw that last time a capacitor that has ground on both sides plays no role in the circuit, so it can be thrown away. So remove or merge capacitors. For some of them it's possible to do that, so we'll try to do that because that reduces the number of capacitors in the circuit. Okay, so the next step, we 
uh, write the transfer function. So now we have to do a complete small signal analysis and find the transfer function. So compute the transfer function. All right. And then if you remember what we, uh, so that's the transfer function which we call H of S. And if you remember, we said that uh, for frequency response, we assume a sinusoidal input, not any arbitrary input, uh, in which case S can be replaced with J omega. So what we do is we compute the magnitude of H evaluated when S is replaced with J omega. And that's what we call the frequency response. So, and then we go and plot. Plot this, that tells us what shape we have. Does it drop at high frequencies or has some other peaking, anything else like that. So that's how we eventually arrive at the visualization of the performance of the circuit at different frequencies. Now, alternatively, uh, what we could do, uh, let me change the color of the pen here. Uh, in, instead of trying to find the transfer function, which may, may, may be pretty complicated, and going through all of these steps, we could try to do this. Uh, so instead, find the poles by inspection. So remember that uh, we could try to look at every node and find the resistance from that node to AC ground, find the capacitance from that node to AC ground, multiply these two and invert it, divide by 2 pi, that would give us a pole frequency. And we could find the pole frequency associated with every node in the signal path. Uh, of course, if we had the capacitor that uh, was uh, so as we call it floating like this, we would have to apply the Miller effect to it so that it becomes two grounded capacitors and still allows us to uh, perform this approximation. All right? Now, uh, this result is an approximate result. If you remember last time or the time before, we saw that when we apply Miller effect, actually uh, we got rid of a zero. There was a zero in the circuit, the transfer function, but we, uh, Miller effect didn't show it. And then we also had some other complications. So this is an approximation uh, method. This is an exact method. Uh, but uh, this approximation can be much faster uh, in, by hand analysis than this one. So a good engineer knows how to apply intuition to a, to a design, right? So we start out with this because we're trying to understand intuitively what the circuit does, try to understand the general bounds on the performance uh, with some quality, quantitative understanding. And then eventually, if we have to, we go to this uh, procedure and do an exact analysis to see how much our approximation differs from the actual behavior. All right, so both of these are valuable, and you will see that we apply both of these today. All right, so that's the general procedure. And uh, now we want to look at the frequency response of amplifiers. Um, so again, just to make sure that you don't uh, miss the forest because of the trees, I would like to just show you where we're going in this analysis. It's a pretty lengthy and elaborate work, so we'll have to just uh, summarize where we're going. So uh, preview of our analysis, analyses. Okay, so we have seen so many amplifier stages and we want to go and study all of them, right? So here are the amplifier stages. Let's draw a big table here. So we start out with the common emitter and common source stage. So I'll draw just one of them. You know that there are both two of them, right? It looks like this. Input here, output here. Then we saw the common base or common gate stage. 
so C, B, C, G. And that's like this. Input goes here, output comes out here, right? So that's output. Okay, then we saw the emitter follower and the source follower. So the follower. So in this case, the input goes to base, comes out of the emitter or the MOS counterpart. And then in this course in electronics 2, we saw the cascode structure. So we have the cascode amplifier. So again, it could be MOS, it could be bipolar. The input goes here, comes out here. All right. And then we saw the differential pair. So we have the diff pair, again, in MOS or bipolar. So here's our diff pair. We have the outputs here and the inputs here. Okay, so these are all the circuits that we have analyzed. Uh, we know how to calculate their uh, uh, low frequency small signal gain, right? The voltage gain. Uh, so, of course, the question is, what's the frequency limitation of these circuits? If I have a certain design based on this or based on that, uh, can I run it at 1 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz? What limits that performance? So, that's where we're going. Okay. So, we're going to start with the uh, uh, common emitter, common source stage. So, common emitter, common source stage, uh, frequency response. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, just draw them quickly and identify the capacitances as we've done in the past, see if anything can be merged or dropped out, etc. And then uh, we have to uh, do a careful uh, quantitative analysis. All right, so here's where we are. We have our common emitter stage, V out, RC, and I will place the resistor here and I'll call it RB. Uh, similarly, for the common source stage, we have the output here. Uh, let's call this V in. And then here we have RG and then V in. And we'll call this RD. Okay, so take a moment to uh, draw this, these two circuits. And uh, I'm sure you are wondering why we have included these resistors RB and RG. In electronics one, we didn't, right? What is the purpose? Okay, so let me say at the outset that RB and RG only degrade the performance of the circuits. So we would never add them deliberately. So the reason they are here is that they represent something else. And generally what they represent is the output resistance of the previous stage, whatever it is. So, in other words, there might be a stage like here that is uh, driving uh, this circuit. And uh, it is that that is, uh, has some sort of output resistance, and that output resistance can be modeled by RB. Similarly here, right? So there is probably some stage that comes before this stage. Right? And that stage has some sort of output resistance. So that's the purpose of these, to make sure that the analysis is complete enough to uh, predict what happens if uh, this circuit is driven not by an ideal voltage source, but by some sort of finite source resistance. Okay. All right. Now, uh, we're going to drop in the capacitances quickly. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we go to this color. We have one cap here, C mu. One cap here, C pi. One cap here, C G S. One here, C G D. 
one here CDB and then finally one here CSB okay three for the bipolar device four for the MOS device <clears throat> all right can anything be merged oh sorry I forgot one here uh, CCS uh, collector substrate capacitance are there any here that can be removed or merged um, not here but here we see that CSB goes from ground to ground so that's out of the picture so now the two circuits look similar in terms of the configuration of the three capacitances right so this goes from base to collector goes from gate to drain this goes from base to ground this goes from gate to ground and from up to ground from up to ground all right so in other words I'm thinking maybe I can just perform one analysis for both of these circuits right is there any difference between these two in terms of the overall topology and there is one little difference the small signal model of a bipolar transistor has an R pi between the base and the emitter uh, the small signal of the MOSFET doesn't so if we can take care of that difference maybe we can just have perform the analysis once okay so let's do that quickly I'm going to draw the small signal model of the circuit here's what we have we have RB V in then I have R pi with V pi on it the emitter is grounded right so I'm just drawing the small signal model of the bipolar transistor okay uh, then I also have C pi C pi on this side C pi from base to emitter then we have a current source that looks at V pi so G and V pi and then we have this resistor RC if we want we can include also the RO of the transistor but don't worry about it and then we have a cap C mu and then we have a cap C C S so if I draw this model for the circuit on the right hand side what's the difference okay this resistor is there the, the names change right but it's still there this is not there we don't have our pi we have a cap CGS we have this cap CGD we have this we have this we have this so the only difference between the small signal models of these two circuits is this resistor here our pi okay all right so can I do something so that the two become very become identical in terms of topology yes uh, look at this we have V in a resistor another resistor what can I do with that I can replace it by a Thevenin equivalent right so that would be something like this right this is still V pi it still goes in here between these two except that these two are merged into one so that becomes RB in parallel with R pi the Thevenin resistance is obtained by setting the independent source to zero so if this is set to zero it becomes a short circuit so looking this way we see these two in parallel so that's the seven and resistance and the seven and voltage is how much uh, what we see uh, when we measure this open circuit output voltage right this voltage is how much this voltage is, is given by this voltage divided between these two so the voltage that we measure here would be V in times R pi divided by R pi plus R B okay so the key here is that if I replace this part of the circuit by a seven and equivalent then the small signal model that I have here for the bipolar uh, circuit is identical in topology to the one that we have here right uh, resistance a single resistance going from the input to the controlling terminal some capacitance uh, to ground some capacitance from the input to the output and all the stuff right they are identical 
So we will not bother drawing the circuit twice. We will just analyze uh, this circuit or this circuit, right? If you analyze this circuit, it's the same as this circuit. All right, so I'm going to focus on the frequency response of this one. All right, so let's go and draw out that circuit in the next page. <clears throat> okay, so here's what we have. We have RG and input V in, and then uh, we have uh, V1, GM V1, then uh, we have a capacitor, then we have a resistor, RD. These all go to ground. We have a cap, CGS1, another cap, CGD1, and this is CDD1. So I want to make sure that uh, you are with me. Okay, I want to make sure that you see why the bipolar circuit and the MOS circuit have this structure, right? You just change the names, right? The, this is V1 or VPi, this is CGS, CGS or CPi, it doesn't matter, right? The structure is the same. So we find the transfer function for this one. We have also found it for the bipolar circuit. The only difference is that in the case of the bipolar circuit, this terminal voltage is now called V in times R pi over R pi plus R B, right? And then this resistor is not called R G, it's called R B in parallel with R pi. Right? That's the only difference. Otherwise, they are identical. Okay, so here's the circuit that we have. And the input, oops, sorry, the input is going here. And the output is taken from here with respect to ground, right? This is with respect to ground. And we would like to find the transfer function from V in to V out. Okay, so this is uh, the circuit that we have. It has three capacitors. We can't remove or merge anything else. That's what, what we got. Uh, so we might expect a third order transfer function maybe because we have three capacitors. Maybe not, maybe yes, we'll see. Uh, but it seems a pretty elaborate circuit, right? Now, fundamentally, this is something that you should be able to do from your basic circuit theory classes. In your circuit theory classes, you have learned about resistors and capacitors, about dependent current sources, and KVL and KCL and all that, so we should be able to do that, right? Um, okay, so that's certainly possible, and we will do that. Uh, but uh, why don't we try an approximate method first and see how much luck we have with that one, right? So the approximate method, as I mentioned here, was this, that... Uh, instead of trying to write the transfer function, we'll try to find the poles by inspection. That means that I would like to go to every node in the signal path and associate a pole with it. And then once I have the poles, uh, based on the poles and using Bode plots, I can quickly construct the frequency response. Okay, so uh, let's try that first before we jump into an exact analysis, uh, just to get warmed up, just to see what the circuit does. Okay, so we're going to start with approach one. Uh, finding the poles by inspection. So it's an approximate technique, right? Uh, but uh, it's good. It, it helps us a lot in terms of uh, gaining a good understanding of what the circuit is doing. All right, well, uh, so the only capacitor that presents a problem in this case is the CGD1 because it's not from a node to ground. So I'm going to apply Miller's theorem to this capacitor so that it becomes two grounded capacitors and then we will proceed. All right, so let's do that. <clears throat> 
apply Miller's theorem to CGD1. All right, so no problem. Uh, that's what we get. I'm going to draw the circuit quickly. V in RG. So we have a capacitor. Miller said take this capacitor, decompose it into two. One going from here to ground equal to CGD1 times 1 minus AV. So CGD1 times 1 minus AV. AV is the voltage gain from here to here. And the approximation is that we calculate that voltage gain without the capacitors present. So low frequency voltage gain. The low frequency voltage gain is given by how much from here to here? It's a simple comma source stage, so it's minus GMRD. So it would be 1 minus, minus GMRD, so plus GMRD. Okay, so remember that this becomes one like this, CGD times 1 minus AV, right, at the input, and another one like this, which is CGD times 1 minus 1 over AV at the output, right? So I'm including the one at the input because the low frequency value of AV is minus GMRD. Okay. So that's the effect of CGD1. Now we have the rest of the stuff. So we have CGS, uh, then we have V1 here, and then this voltage looks at V1, this current source looks at V1, <clears throat> and then we have CDB1, and then we have the effect of CGD at the output. So this is one minus one over AV, so I have to include that. CGD is a grounded capacitor equal to CGD minus 1 over AV. Right, AV is minus GMRD, so that would be 1 plus 1 over GMRD. And then finally, this resistor, RD. Okay, so we managed to uh, remove CGD, which was causing trouble in terms of finding poles by inspection, and convert it to two capacitors, one on this side, one on this side. Now the circuit is sort of clean, right? We can say, yes, I have an, a capacitance and a resistance associated with this node. And the capacitance and the resistance associated with this node, right? Uh, I, I can find the total grounded capacitance a total grounded resistance, multiply, invert to find the pole frequency. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We say omega P in, that is the pole associated with the input of the circuit. So omega P in arises from this node, omega P in. So as we saw before, this would be equal to uh, the resistance 1 over the resistance to AC ground, so when you set this to zero, because it's an independent source, the resistance is RG times the capacitance to ground. How much capacitance do we have into, to ground? We have this guy plus this guy. They're parallel. So that would be CGD1 times 1 plus GMRD plus CGS. Very good. Very quick, right? We found the input pole of the circuit. We call it the input pole because it appears at the input of the circuit. Not quite the input. The, you can consider the input here or here. It depends, but we, it's usually here, right? Because this RG it doesn't really belong in the circuit. It, it represents something else. <clears throat> okay, one more pole <clears throat> here. So we're going to call that omega P out. <clears throat> omega P out, the output pole. So that's uh, uh, according to the same procedure, right? Omega P out would be 1 over the total resistance that we see from 
here to AC ground when all other independent sources are set to zero. So when we set this to zero, this is zero, this is zero. We have a resistance RD to ground and a capacitance to ground. So that would be RD times CDB1, CDB1 plus CGD times 1 plus 1 over GMRD. That's the output frequency, output pole frequency. Okay, that's great. So we found the two poles. We didn't find any zeros because uh, our method doesn't really look for zeros, right? And uh, in most circuits, in probably 90% of circuits, zeros don't matter anyway. So that's good. That's good enough. So we have two poles. And again, depending on where the poles are, we could construct our frequency response. So H of J omega versus omega. So Bodhi says that uh, we start low frequencies. At very low frequencies, what's the transfer function? The capacitors are open, we have a simple common source stage, the gain is GMRD, so the absolute value, the gain is minus GMRD, the absolute value is GMRD. <clears throat> As the frequency goes up, we reach the first pole. Which one is the first pole? We don't know. Let's say omega P in is the first pole, right? Maybe. So omega P in is here. Bodhi says once you reach the first pole, the slope goes down by 20 dB per decade. So 20 dB per decade. So this becomes minus 20 dB per decade. We go on until we reach the second pole. So if indeed omega P out is a, at a higher frequency, then once we reach here, the slope becomes minus 40. Minus 40. 40 dB per decade. So this would be the frequency response of the circuit. So if you have numerical values for all these things, it's pretty quick, right? We can quickly construct this and see uh, whether uh, this type of bandwidth satisfies our needs. If you're building a one gigahertz amplifier, uh, what's this value, what's this value, can we amplify the signal or not, right? Okay, so that's uh, the first approach. Uh, this approach is good. Uh, of course, it has these approximations. Now we're going to go to the second approach, in which case we perform an exact analysis. Of course, I wanted to ma make sure you remember that in the first approach, we do see the Miller multiplication of CGD. Right? So CGD does become suddenly large uh, as far as uh, this pole is concerned. Right? This, uh, the input pole sees the Miller multiplication of CGD, not just CGD. So that's something to remember. That's the Miller effect, right? Okay, so for the exact analysis, uh, we have to uh, draw out the entire circuit, which we have here. And we have to write some equations. I'm going to write only two KCLs and see how it goes, okay? We write a KCL here at the output node and a KCL at the input node. This is what we call uh, nodal analysis, right? So KCL at output. That means that add up all of the currents that flow through these devices to zero, right? How much is the current through RD? So V out over RD. How much is the current through CDB1? That would be V out divided by the impedance of CDB1, right? So impedance of CDB1 is 1 over CDB1S. So when I divide this by this, I will get V out CDB1S. All right? Okay. Then we have this current, GMV1. And then we have this current. How much is that current? That current is this voltage minus this voltage divided by that impedance. 
So it's V out minus V1 divided by 1 over CGD1S. So again, it gets multiplied. CGD1S. Okay, all these four currents have to add up to zero. They're all coming out of that node, so they have to add up to zero. Okay, let's write the KCL at this node. So KCL at, uh, let's call this node X, and node X, right? Okay, so again, same story. Uh, what, how much is the current flowing through RG in this direction? This voltage minus this voltage divided by RG. This voltage is V1, so V in minus V1 divided by RG. So, V in minus V1 divided by RG. Now this current comes in and it has to supply the current that goes this way and the current that goes this way. So we'll say this is equal to the current that goes this way. That would be Vx, V1, this voltage, minus this voltage divided by this impedance. So that's V1 minus V out times CGD1S. All right. So these two are similar, right? They do by a negative sign because previously I looked at this current, now I'm looking at this current. Okay, what else? We have a current going through CGS, so plus V1 CGS S. So that's the current going through CGS. All right, so we have two equations and two unknowns. The unknowns are V1 and V out. We don't really care about V1, we are interested in V out. But I would like to find V out in terms of V in, right? Not in terms of V1. So we have to find V1 and V out from here. So eliminate V1, find V out in terms of V1. This is something you have to do once in your lifetime, okay? So that you understand the mechanics of doing that. All right, so at the end, we find V out in terms of V in, so we can find V out over V in. And that becomes a very large fraction. So I have to include that somewhere. Let me see where I can include that. Uh, let me try to erase this part. All right. So here's what the transfer function looks like. Okay. So V out over V in is equal to a very long transfer function. In the numerator, we have a zero. And that zero is given by CGD S minus GM and then RD. All right. CGD. Okay, should be called CGD, not CGD. CGD1, CGD minus GM. In the denominator, we have a second order polynomial, not third order, okay, second order. So there's S squared, S, and a constant. So we have to write these with their, their big coefficients. The coefficient of S squared is like this. So we have the cross products of all three capacitors. Cross products means CGS times CGD, CGS times CDB, etc. Okay, so again, let's not worry about this here. Okay, so CGS CGD plus CGS CDB plus CGD CDB. And this gets multiplied by the two resistances that we have. RG and RD. RG, RD, S squared. Okay, that's the S squared term. 
All right. Then we have an S term, right? This is a second order polynomial. So the S term. The S term looks like this. So we have one, uh, we have C, G, D, and its Miller effect, G, M, R, D. We see that. And uh, just like before, you see, these two got, got added to each other. So it, here also they get added to each other, plus C, G, S. And then this whole thing is multiplied by R, G. Just like before, right? You see, this is what we did. We added these two multiplied by RG. So we see that there are two. But there's another term which comes from the output network. And that's RD times CDB plus CGD. This whole thing multiplied by S. Uh, let me just check. And then finally, plus one. All of this goes in the denominator of this transfer function. Okay, so that's what we get from the exact analysis. All right, so we should uh, look at this very carefully. You should uh, analyze it, uh, consider it in different cases and so forth. Uh, this equation, if you just look at it, doesn't tell us much, right? Okay, so a big second-order equation. Uh, if I have numbers, I can find the poles and the zeros and so on. But beyond that, it doesn't tell me much, right? But if we uh, delve into it and uh, look at some special cases, it does give us some intuition. And in particular, it will tell us uh, whether or not this result has any resemblance to this result. This was from the approximate method. We have found only two poles. Uh, this is the exact method. It has two poles, but it also has a zero. Are these two poles near these two poles or not, etc.? All these things that are interesting questions that we have to answer. Okay, so let's start with uh, the simple observation. Uh, so here are some observations that we can make. All right, so we have a zero. And the frequency of the zero is given by, if you set this to zero, it's the gm over cgd. Okay, that's a zero. Now, without going through details, I will say that uh, this is a very high frequency. So, typically unimportant. Typically unimportant. So in most uh, cases when we have a circuit like this, this, this zero doesn't play a significant role in the performance, in the high frequency performance of the circuit, so we don't worry about it too much. Yes, there is zero, it's this much, but we don't worry about it. Okay, so then we're going to focus on the denominator and see what kind of information we can extract from it. Of course, you can solve this quadratic, it's not that hard, but then what? You get up with this big square root, and then what do we do with it, right? There's not much we can do. So we'll try to make some approximations and see if it gives us additional understanding of uh, the circuit's limitations. All right, well, um, one of the approximations that we're going to make is this. We will assume that this has two poles. We'll assume one of the poles has a much lower frequency than the other one, or one has much higher frequency than the other one. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to call this the dominant pole approximation. And by that we mean omega p1, one pole, is much less than the other pole. If one pole is much lower, we call that the dominant pole. Because in our frequency response, you can see that if this is much lower than the other one, by the time we get here, we start rolling off. So the 3 dB bandwidth is limited by this pole, not by that pole, right? So we call this the dominant pole. 
So dominant pole is the one that's much lower. Okay, so it turns out that when we make this approximation, we can actually simplify this. And we can find nice simple equations for omega p1 and for omega p2. And then from there see whether the results agree with these two or not and so on. So it's very nice. Of course, whether the dominant pole approximation holds in a given circuit has to be checked, right? In probably 80% of circuits it does, but if it doesn't then we will see, right? So we make this approximation, we go forward, and then we see if the numbers that we get for omega 1 and omega p2 are indeed far apart. One is much higher than the other one. So this is something that we will uh, work on next time. And from there we find uh, interesting results for this denominator. And then we come back and compare with this approach, which was just by inspection. And uh, there that will give us some better understanding. All right, I'll see you next time.